All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to start our lightning session, but we're going to begin with a uh, brief talk given by Elliot Carroll of Lunar Resources. People in the room, I must ask you to be quiet. I got a four o'clock flight, so uh, stop talking. Where, where's the click? All right, uh, my name is Elliot Carroll. I'm the CEO of Lunar Resources. We're the company developing resource extraction and manufacturing technologies for off Earth applications. I want to give a, qu a quick overview of our updates for this year. So here I go. It's going to be quick. I thought it was going to be quick. All right, number one, we are operating our large one meter MRE reactor. It's fully functioning now. We're starting large duration testing next month. You have to tell me, Elliot. All right, oh, <laughs> next. Uh, we have successfully extracted and refined high purities from 99% aluminum and silicon from our MRE process. We are producing ISRU, so in situ resource, uh, in situ photovoltaic solar cells from the byproducts we're producing. And we have established a large, uh, a, a prime partner uh, strategic relationship uh, for uh, strategic implementation of our resource extraction technologies. Next. Um, and we are also doing a broad expansion of our team and partners in 2023. Next slide. In order for us to implement, we need power on the moon. We need a large power grid. There are commercial companies that are not in the space industry that are now willing to participate in this and invest hundreds of millions of dollars. We've successfully have a program that has been approved to do that. But I wanna again emphasize, we need power on the moon and a large, large amounts of power to implement industrial capabilities in the lunar surface. Next slide. And if you are interested in working with us as a partner, as an employee, as a subcontractor, please reach out. We are doing major expansions over the next six months. Thank you. All right, and now we're about to begin our session. And the first person we're going to have up to speak is Reza, Reza Ashtiani. All right, thank you everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Reza Ashtiani. I'm an associate professor in the civil engineering department of UTEP. And since a year and a half ago, I had the privilege to be at the Air Force Academy. The research that you're seeing here is at the Air Force, the research that we did on, at the Air Force Academy on the geotechnical aspects of lunar regolith. Specifically, we are looking at the geometrical characteristics. It's basically related to the particle shape, particle angularity, and the surface textural properties of the regolith simulants. We believe that uh, the particle geometry has a uh, significant influence on the anisotropic behavior of the material, and therefore it needs to be properly characterized. And we use two different systems. We use aggregate imaging system, and we use a perplometer to be able to get those parameters. I invite you to come and see the posters that we have. We have three posters specifically on these uh, topics. And we're gonna talk about, we basically uh, elaborate on the influence of the deformation characteristics, settlement characteristics, and also uh, the deformations that uh, basically will be induced by the passage of the rovers under dynamic loading conditions. So ultimately uh, the gist of the research basically told us that uh, the regular simulants, they have high angularity characteristics, and it's important to consider the anisotropic characteristics of the regular simulants when you're doing the mechanical analysis. And the other aspect of that has to do with the longevity of the, uh, longevity of the EVA suits, and that has to do with the puncturing and durability of extravehicular uh, uh, suits that we have. So that's basically what I had. Uh, again, I invite you to come and uh, to see us at the poster sections, and we'll be happy to answer any questions after this point. Thank you, everyone. At this point, I'd like to welcome Doug Cortez. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good. My name is Douglas Cortez. I am an associate professor in the civil engineering department at New Mexico State University. I am also a senior investigator at the Center for Biomediated and Bioinspired Geotechnics. Um, in this slide, what I'm showing is two trucks. Those two trucks are a, a drill rig and a CPT truck, two of the most common uh, devices that we use for near surface, uh, subsurface exploration. The CPT truck is used to push a probe, an instrumented probe that is shown in the, in the image, uh, and it pushes it down to about a depth of 30 meters. Now, if you take the depth range uh, for that truck, which is 30 meters, and the weight of it, which is 20 tons, 
you get a ratio that gives you an idea of how good or how efficient that equipment is at leveraging its mass to access the subsurface. That ratio comes down to one and a half millimeters per kilogram. Now, airworms have been borrowing on the ground for a couple hundred years, 100 million years, uh, and a 50 gram worm is able to go down to a depth of about two meters. So the ratio there is 40 millimeters per kilogram, which is one order of magnitude higher than the CPD curve. Now that's impressive, except that it's wrong. That number should be 40 meters per kilogram. So it's 40,000 millimeters per kilogram, four orders of magnitude, more effective at using its mass to go into a subsurface. Now, to me, that's about a thousand reasons to take a look at the airborne for inspiration in the development of lightweight or uh, low gravity subsurface exploration equipment, which is exactly what we try to do in our lab. Now, it's extremely difficult to convince a worm to dig into dry uh, lunar regolith simulant. So instead of doing that, we develop a number of bios power prototypes to just test that. Two of those devices are presented in the slide. What we have found through those devices is that we can reduce the regolith penetration resistance substantially. So, uh, and the process moreover is optimizable. So you can increase the depth range for the devices while minimizing the amount of energy that is needed to get there. So if you're interested in some of this work, please come talk to me. We have a poster in the, in the session and just see me, thank you. At this point, I'd like to welcome Vijay Devarakanda. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Vijay and uh, I'm with uh, Analytical Scientific Products. We are a, a recent startup from Dallas. Um, we uh, have a, an SBIR project from NASA to develop a dust uh, filtration and collection system. So uh, basically uh, our uh, task is to, uh, uh, to uh, filter the particles in the spacecraft and create clean air for, for the crew. And uh, in addition to collection and uh, uh, filtration, we are, uh, our uh, filter is also capable of uh, self-monitoring. So basically it can track how much dust is getting in and how much is leaving with the clean air. Um, so uh, uh, the uniqueness of this filter is that we don't use any filtration media like HEPA filters. So we use uh, a combination of fluid mechanics and electrodynamic forces to uh, move the particles to where we want them to go, which is a, a dust collection bag. Um, so uh, since we don't use uh, any filtration media, uh, the pressure drops are going to be very low and uh, we are going after like uh, reducing the maintenance requirements on the filter, uh, like uh, replacing filtration media and things like that. Um, the filter is uh, agnostic to any kind uh, source of dust. So we are, it's going to be equally effective in filtering both the dust that originates inside the, uh, inside the spacecraft and uh, the lunar surface dust that, that comes from outside. So we have a poster and uh, uh, we, uh, we would like to welcome you all to come to the poster and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. I'd like to welcome Akalen Grant and Ayana DeSears. Hi, I'm Akalen Grant. I'm a junior architectural engineering student at North Carolina a and State University. Hi, my name is Ayana DeSears. I'm a dual degree physics and aerospace engineering major at Spelman College. And we'll be presenting to you our lunar radiation shielding for astronauts using 3D printed regolith. So basically this is meant to protect astronauts from life-threatening radiation or meteorite impacts or solar flares on the lunar surface um, in the event of an emergency. And so the background behind our design is basically taking um, our two most common research shapes, um, which were the cone and dome shape, which um, was calculated to be the most um, efficient design for lunar habitats. And this will allow us to highlight the benefits of both shapes um, according to the lunar environment, which is necessary due to the fact that um, the lunar environment has such an unpredictable uh, wide range of emergencies. So we decided to keep the shelter above ground, which would eliminate the need for excavation and construction and the lunar regolith will protect against certain environmental conditions. Um, our shelter has an intended use of about 30 days, which will provide enough time for protection against environmental irregularities. For materials, we decided to go with the lunar regolith and then also a layer of aluminum because it's lightweight, has a high strength to weight ratio, and when alloyed with other metals can become even more um, strong. 
and we decided that we were going to use regolith because it eliminates the need to bring materials um, from earth and the next steps would be to finalize location and positioning and also decide what technologies might be necessary in the shelter as well as finalize designs and the draft. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome Thomas Pryor speaking on behalf of Jarrett Matthews. All right, hello everyone. My name is Thomas Pryor. I'm an avionics engineer at Astrolab. We are a venture-backed startup uh, in Hawthorne, California. We're creating a modular and multi-purpose lunar rover to launch to the South Pole of the Moon in 2026. Uh, so as launch technology has increased, we're, be able, we're able to see more and more mass to orbit and more and more mass per landing to the lunar surface. And eventually this will approach the order of tens of tons per landing in, in just a single landing. And so this offers us a really unique opportunity to reevaluate evaluate how we approach surface systems without such a stringent mass constraint. Um, and eventually we'll be closer and closer to achieving economies of scale on the, on the lunar surface. Uh, so similar to how we move cargo on Earth, we've developed the Flex Rover, um, stands for flexible logistics and exploration. And this offers us a lot of versatility and we can perform anything from uh, crew transport, surface logistics, in situ resource utilization, et cetera. So last spring we presented on our modular cargo system. And since then we've worked on our payload mezzanine and robotic arm. So uh, in the lower left there, you see our payload mezzanine it offers 15 slots of uh, volume 12 U each and can hold 25 kilograms per slot. And the mezzanine also provides each of the payloads with power and comms to each of the uh, CubeSat-like uh, modules. We've also developed a six degree of freedom robotic arm with a dust tolerant end effector so we can interface with multiple attachments uh, for a wide range of activities. So for our 2026 mission, we are signing up customers at a price point that is more than competitive with what's currently available in the market. So if you'd like to learn more, please stop by our poster later in the conference. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to welcome um, MD Mahmoudur Rahman. Hi, actually, I'm Mohuddin Ahmad, a research LCA to the Aerospace Center, and uh, I'm a part of the Lucer team. So in my two minutes, here, so I'll be talking a little bit about the cryogenic heat pipe as well as the uh, delamination of uh, the ice from the cold plate. It is a part of the big project we have that is the lunar ice collection system. And if you look at the big picture, we have five objectives for this project, five tasks. And the first of all is the determination of the thermophysical properties of the ice regolith. Then we need to find a way to extract the water molecules from the ice regolith, and we need a way to transport it to the cold plate and collect it over there. And we all we are doing uh, good with all this step. And at the end, we'll develop a prototype. After that, we need to do a skill up analysis to meet the design requirements as well as to find out the payloads for the clips mission. So that's the overall picture uh, uh, for the Lustre uh, project we have. And for the cryogenic heat pipe that uh, we are developing, we have all three components as other heat pipes. Here I am just showing uh, the evaporative section as we have limited time. And we have the micro pillars at uh, interval ranging from 400 to 600 uh, micrometer. We try to find out the best uh, and more efficient and powerful heat pipe. And we saw if we do the additively manufactured one, if we look at the graph at the top one, it is the best one we found so far with titanium 64. So uh, we are moving towards that direction to use additively manufactured heat pipe that meets the requirement of the mission objective. If you look at the horizontal line, we are uh, at the uh, requirements. So our heat pipe is capable enough uh, to meet the requirement for the mission. And for the ice collection system, if MD, we... I'm afraid your time has elapsed. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you. I'd like to wel welcome Kaizad Remelwala. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I'm Kaizad from Mission Control. We're a company based in Ottawa, Canada, and uh, we develop a space flight software for exploring Earth, Moon, Mars, and beyond, uh, focusing on autonomy and mission operations. So uh, I think at the last OSEC meeting, my colleague presented a poster on our uh, AI uh, artificial intelligence payload that's flying to the moon for uh, processing rover images. Uh, it's launching in a few weeks now. Hope it all goes well. Um, this poster, I wanted to highlight some updates. We participated in the ESA ESRIC Space Resources Challenge. So 
uh, on one of Paul's slides earlier, you saw uh, ESA and Luxembourg facility. So uh, we went there, uh, our team went there this September to compete in this challenge. Uh, so this challenge, uh, it kind of included communications uh, latencies and uh, communications dropouts. And so it challenged teams to accomplish certain scientific objectives and exploration objectives in a two or three hour window. And so we competed with uh, our basic uh, R&D rover test platform, but we also partnered with uh, Impossible Sensing. Uh, they have a pretty cool LIBS sensor for scientific investigations. Uh, and MDA, the, the Canadian company you know that provided the robotic arm, they also have uh, other sensors like LIDARs. Uh, our main focus in, in this uh, effort was to demonstrate our software capabilities and, and operation strategies. And so our, our team uh, went to do exactly that. So uh, this QR code over here goes to our website uh, and you can also book a demo with our uh, mission control software. So uh, happy to chat more at my poster. Thanks. I'd like to welcome John Kennedy presenting on behalf of Brad Reardon. Uh, hi, I'm John Kennedy with X Energy out of Rockville, Maryland. Uh, we're a nuclear reactor design company. Um, and we recently won one of three NASA and DOE awards to design a lunar fission surface power reactor. Um, but the thing we're really excited about about that technology is we're designing that system to be modular and scalable to different missions, different architectures, different power levels. Uh, really, for us, the, the secret is, is in our fuel, our Triso X fuel facility that it just broke ground uh, in Tennessee. Uh, we'll provide the fuel for these reactors. Uh, it's highly enriched, or excuse me, high assay, low enriched uranium fuel, avoiding proliferation risk. Uh, it allows us to, to play with different fuel forms, uh, depending on what reactor we're looking at. Our current uh, lunar FSP reactor system uh, is unique in that we're leveraging both our experience in reactor design and our sister company, Intuitive Machines Experience, in space uh, systems and space landers. Uh, we're targeting a 40 kilowatt electric system that can operate for 10 years uh, with a 6,000 kilogram system mass and looking at a late 2020 landing. We look at scaling that system up in the future. You know, there's a lot of challenges that come with that. One of the big ones are, are payload capacity, both for launch and landing. So we're trying to identify what are the challenges, what are the gaps in the technology that can help us to expand that in the future. Just kind of close with, you know, we've made a, a big push in the recent years to really develop our design and analysis capabilities at X-Energy. And uh, we have a really robust tool set uh, for completing these types of designs. So if anyone has any questions, come catch me at the poster session. I'm happy to talk. I'd like to welcome Caitlin Roberts. Hello, everyone. I'm Second Lieutenant Caitlin Roberts. I just graduated the U.S. Air Force Academy with an astronautical engineering degree. And I'm Second Lieutenant Jake Branham. I also graduated from the Air Force Academy, but I got my undergrad in civil engineering. So our research focused on varied densities of lunar regolith for radiation protection. So NASA has a goal to reach a dose exposure rate of less than 300 millisieverts per six-month mission. So our goal was to reach that as well. Uh, we looked at three different uh, densities for with two different additives of lunar regolith and polyethylene, and we inputted these into the Alteros modeling tool. Uh, this was our analytical results, and the overall takeaway was that we did reach well under 300 millisieverts. The uh, regolith and the additives were both at a 50-50 ratio, so we soon realized this wasn't very realistic for a lunar mission, so we jumped into experimental results. On the experimental results, we decided to go with vibratory compaction. The idea behind that was we didn't want to have any particle crushing with the lunar regolith. When we ended up actually mixing the additives, we found that it really wasn't possible uh, due to the air pockets when we were mixing that regolith and the additives together. So because of the mixing procedure not turning out the way we wanted, we decided to take a compressed sample of lunar regolith with a solid block of polyethylene, and we received the, des the best dose exposure rate. So it concluded that a layered sample for infrastructure um, for pr radiation protection on the moon was the best scenario to go with. And furthermore, when you compress the regolith to uh, a higher level, you can add more protective material in the same amount of volume. So that would be very beneficial for uh, just cost efficiency and 
exporting materials to the moon. So please check out our poster. Thank you. I'd like to welcome Alexander Summers presenting on behalf of Michael Zanetti. Hello, I'm Alexander Summers. I'm representing Marshall Space Flight Center over in Huntsville, Alabama. There's been a lot of talk today about um, proving grounds. Well, today I'm gonna to talk about Marshall's newest capability, the Lunar Regolithic Rain Shield. This is an outdoor 125 by 125 foot by 125 foot regolith shield with a lunar regolith simulant pulled from Merriam Crater in Flagstaff, Arizona. We have tried to build this field with ease and flexibility as our kind of main choices here. So this is reconfigurable. You can put craters and mounts where you need. We have movable hazards, boulders that can be moved as needed. And ease wise, this is on-site parking. We can ship directly to this field. We have a climate controlled and portable transportation command center over there. And on top of that, we have these for our field, but we kind of mentioned this before. The outdoor field is not the only solution. So at Marshall Center, we also have capabilities such as our V20 dirty regolith um, vacuum chamber, as well as the Huntsville Operations Support Center, where these can provide additional benefits to anyone who wants to come to Marshall and use our center for these lunar regolith surface research capabilities. Additionally, here I have in the bottom three of these really cool videos we've had from our own field usage. So these are videos we've taken from our optical and LIDAR-based navigation. These are capabilities we're working on, but we're also interested in what you are working on. So we are looking for partnerships in both academic and commercial, and we want to bring you to Marshall as well as the other centers around NASA to try and work out your problems, and we hope we can help. Now, I'm Alexander Summers. My other part, POC is Michael Zanetti, and we're both accessible for questions with the poster session, I think both virtually and here. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, we're going to move to our virtual presenters. Uh, so we'll start with Cedric Copa de la Fuente. Hello, can, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Cedric Copa de la Fuente. I'm a principal electrical engineer at the Lunar Surface System Group at Astrobotic. And I'm the principal investigator of a recently awarded uh, SBIR contract funded by NASA. Uh, which will support the development of technologies um, that will enable the Astrobotic Cube rover and small rovers alike to survive uh, extreme cold temperature um, for extended period of time uh, on the lunar surface. So the concept is to um, develop and integrate a small uh, radio isotope uh, heater unit that will be stored in the cube rover payload compartment using a standardized uh, mounting bolt pattern and thermal strapping, strapping <coughs> which could easily be um, reused for all kinds of uh, robotics pl platforms in, in the future. Um, so Astrobotic is working with several radio isotope suppliers to identify the best option in terms of cost and safety. A uh, uh, request for information has been released uh, over the past summer, and uh, we, uh, a request uh, for proposal will be shared uh, in the coming weeks with interested parties. Uh, the goal is to design a unit that can fit uh, the 10 by 10 centimeter payload volume uh, of the cube rover, and uh, to develop a solution that weighs less than uh, one kilogram. And uh, in addition of developing the RHU, Astrobotic uh, also work on developing a smart thermal management system, uh, which will allow the decoupling of the heat source from the electronic. And so we have developed, uh, we're developing an extra lightweight uh, lit system uh, that can be reconfigured uh, rapidly to support cold temperature. Um, the project, the project is uh, 30 months uh, long and uh, will enhance the cube rover design that was previous, previously mature to a tipping point program that concluded last month. Thank you all and uh, please join me uh, to the poster session. Thank you. Next up we have Deborah Esumang. Hello everyone, my name is Zebra Saman. I go by Derby. So our poster session is the gaseous byproducts of thermal vacuum processing of the lunar Helen Simland. To ensure that we do not resupply oxygen from Earth to the moon, we are trying to build this MRE um, technology that Elliot had mentioned um, previously. Um, so it goes through the four steps of vacuum, resistive heating, regulate melts, and then gas detection. Um, 
but then in order for us to be able to continue building it and then use this in, in our assist chamber, which is pretty big, we did um, a small chamber testing um, to understand the morphology changes and also change in concentration of oxygen, as well as VOCs that give off during the heating. So in the middle, we see um, the schematic of the small chamber testing that we used, as well as some of the results from the EDS, FESEMs, and residual gas analyzer um, that we, we, we performed. Um, we had a couple of slight changes in concentrations of um, gases that were detected as compared to the controls. Um, the simulant that we used were from um, the Exilit lab. It's the Lunar Highland simulant one. Um, I'm just inviting everyone to join me during the poster session. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Tyler Farr. Awesome. I assume you guys can hear me all right. Yes, we can. Awesome. Well, uh, my name is Tyler Farr from Georgia Tech, and I'll be talking about my work on characterizing water vapor transport through packed beds of Lunar Highland and Lunar Mari simulants, which we got from Exilith Labs. As you've heard a lot about today, there are plenty of permanently shattered regions, especially those clustered in the south pole of the moon that are predicted to contain vast ice deposits. And of the many methods discussed to harvest this ice, our lab focuses on the thermal extraction using concentrated solar radiation. We are currently setting up to experimentally test these processes with our high flux solar simulator in simulated lunar conditions. But to understand the thermal extraction of the trapped ice within the regolith, we need to understand the water vapor diffusion through the lunar soil, especially in flow regimes relevant in situ resource utilization. Therefore, we built this experimental apparatus, which I've nicknamed Steve, for the studying of transport of evolved volatiles effectively, um, which inside we have a packed bed at measured porosities of various simulants from Exilith Labs, including JC1A. We then use a controlled evaporative mixer to flow 0.05 grams to two grams an hour of water vapor through the packed bed while measuring the pressure and temperature at various key points. The entire system is also kept at a high vacuum to study the diffusion in the slip all the way through the Knudsen flow regime. From the experimental data, we created the piecewise model shown at the bottom right that was computationally fit to the experimental data, and it can be used as a predictive tool for the diffusion of water vapor as a function of pack bed porosity, total pressure, and temperature of the regular pack bed, and is continuous through the flow regime to the Knudsen flow regime. Uh, so please stop by the poster session to chat about the experimental findings and the model results, as well as talk about our future plans for experimentally thermal extraction with concentrated slow power. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Next up, we have Allison Good. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Good afternoon, everybody. Allison Good with Aegis Aerospace. Um, I'm the RAC Deputy PI, which you'll hear about RAC in just a second. We'll be talking to you about the two platforms for lunar testing as a service that Aegis Aerospace has to offer for any of your testing needs. On the right, we have RAC, which is our regolith adherence characterization payload. It's currently at a TRL 8 and is manifested on the Eclipse 19D mission. That's a 2024 launch on Firefly's Blue Ghost Mission 1. RAC will be collecting high resolution photos to evaluate regolith adherence of the samples installed in it. it. Has four enclosed cameras and will be providing UV, infrared, and temperature data. For future RAC missions, we'll have customizable sample trays. So those can be any sort of shape, size that you may need to test experiments. And we can provide exposure less than two and a half feet above the lunar surface to get really good regolith adherence and characterize that. On the left, we have STEF, which is currently at TRL-5. We're about to move into CDR. This is our Space Science Technology and Evaluation Facility, which is manifested on a 2025 launch on Intuitive Machines Lander. STEF offers power and data for experiments, whereas RAC's more materials focused, STEF is experiment focused can offer up to 20 watts power RS422 communications and 25 kilobit per second downlink for each experiment that staff is carrying. Example experiments are antennas, solar cells, CPUs, and radiation sensors. And we do also have a solar cell test bed to offer if you have solar cells to test but don't have the technology to support that testing. We can offer horizon, sky, and surface views on staff, and it is compatible with any lander. So if you have future needs for experiment testing, take a look at rack or stuff. Um, come see me at the poster if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Next up, we have William Johnson. Hello, thanks for having me. My name is Will Johnson. I'm here at NASA Marshall in Huntsville, Alabama. 
Um, apologies for any coughs or sniffs. I'm just getting over the flu. Uh, I want to give you a real quick overview, high-level overview of some of the recent work we've done on developing thermal control devices for extreme lunar environments. Of course, the challenge here is that to be sustainable in our return to the moon, um, we need our surface assets to survive both in extremely hot and extremely cold environments that we see um, on the poles, on the equator, and in permanently shadowed regions. So at Marshall, we've done a lot of work uh, both internally and with lots of industry partners on developing new systems, new devices, uh, to help solve this problem. Um, so we have some various hardware development efforts here, as you can see in the pictures and the schematics. Uh, some of our specialties are in working on high turn down ratio devices like um, thermal switches, on advanced passive two-phase devices like advanced variable conductance heat pipes and loop heat pipes with thermal control valves, things like that. And then we have lots of experience in pump fluid loops. But not just in the hardware, we have lots of experience in a full system design analysis and testing um, from the component level to the payload level, all the way up to robotic and human rated full systems. Um, some of our recent partners include Astrobotic, Advanced Cooling Technologies, and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And so really, if you have a thermal problem, um, or if you have some development work you want to do, anything, some testing, um, come talk to us. We would love to partner with you. We'd love to help you out if you have a certain problem you're trying to solve. Uh, I'll be at the pleasure session tomorrow, and I'd love to talk to you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Next, we have John Landrino. Hi, everyone. I'm John Landrino from Astrobotics. There are critical challenges to operating on the moon that cannot be addressed without constant power. For example, surviving multiple lunar nights, new mission configurations such as operating in permanently shadowed regions, and in situ resource utilization. SCMD recognized this and is why they called for the vertical solar array technology. Astrobotic has partnered with Redwire and Kennedy. Space Center to develop NASA's future service power solution. Our system is a mobile power management and delivery system with solar input from a modified red wire rollout solar array and electrodynamic set field from KSC. Our mobile platform will deploy from Eclipse Lander, travel remotely to known regions of near constant illumination, remain stable on slopes up to 15 degrees, provide sun tracking for the ROSA, and has an advanced thermal management system that allows it to deliver high power energy and tolerate the extreme cold temperatures of lunar nights. The ROSA is designed to provide a minimum of 10 kilowatts of power for the duration of the VSAT's 10-year mission. KSC's electrodynamic dust shield is a critical element that offers a low power solution to maintaining a dust-free surface on both the ROSA solar cells and the mobile platform's radiators. The Astrobotic VSAT electrical architecture will support both AC power for assets at a distance and DC power for local assets, either by direct connection with a dust tolerant connector or the wireless charging system that my colleague Dr. Caro will present in a few moments, which is developed under SBIR and tipping point contracts. To make use of the wireless charger at a distance from the VSAT, a Q rover based wireless power station can be deployed to regions of interest. Astrobotic has developed under the NASA Game Changing Development Program a solution to support a sustained presence on the lunar surface using its vertical solar array technology. Astrobotic VSAT is a foundational power source for its upcoming lunar surface power surfaces that will enable continuous and sustained human and robotic presence on the moon. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Orion Lawler. Mm -hmm. Lunar mine reclamation, it's important because mistakes on the lunar surface can stay there for millions of years. And it'll only take one dangerous or even ugly lunar mine to endanger popular support for any use of space resources. So principle one, safety over the long term. Deep surface pits will remain hazardous until somebody fixes them. So every excavation should be walkable by a human in an EVA suit. No pit traps, no hazardous waste on the surface. Principle two, uh, the finish site should be reclaimed to look like a natural crater. So circular pit, tailings around the rim, you can grade that back into a crater shape. Uh, leave a shallow ramp out so equipment or visitors can leave the pit. Scrap equipment should be buried right in the central mound. Principle three, uh, scientific exploration and mining should be mutually beneficial. A mine cut can reveal scientifically interesting geology that wouldn't have been found by a little science rover. Uh, scientific and mining organizations that should share rover telemetry, instrumentation, and collaborate on site design. But principle four, use every part of the regolith. So icy regolith may contain more than water, and the other bubbles could be critical for future lunar use. We shouldn't high grade ore uh, uh, and then just dump or vent everything else. That'll make a mining comet plume. 
Uh, the, the last principle here is that we should leave a durable historic record of site operations. Regolith melts down into a black obsidian glass that we could press or etch into little record tokens with maybe a scale model or a 3D site map. Uh, mix a few thousand of these tokens into the central mound and they'll, they'll be discoverable for billions of years. Space gives us a chance to do things right. We should take it. I'm Orion Muller from the University of Alaska Fairbanks and I'll be at virtual poster 2A1. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Arturo Montoya. Hello, my name is Arturo Montoya. I'm part of the Resilient Extraterrestrial Habitats Institute funded by NASA, whose mission is to enable the design and realization of smart and resilient space habitats. We are not aiming to design the best habitat, but rather to learn how to design resilient space habitats to the many disruptions that can occur in space. The realization of resilient space habitats, it's essentially a question of how to select, manage, and use the limited resources. Our approach considers the entire life cycle of the habitat focusing on safety. We have developed three simulation environments to answer our research questions. Today, I'll be talking about one of these platforms, the control-oriented dynamic computational model, which is a Bayesian dynamic network with coarse models of the subsystems of a habitat. Uh, this simulation environment is being used for performing trade studies and generating predictive models. This slide shows the results of a trade study that aimed to identify the structure that exhibits the best performance under impact. We compared the performance of monolithic dome structures made of two materials, regolith and aluminum, and varying thicknesses. As the structure gets damaged due to impact, the structural performance and heat isolation of a smart habitat is affected. So it is crucial to find a structural configuration that adequately controls temperature and also mitigates damage well. We develop a neural network trained to approximate damage for these structures. And within our simulation platform, we estimated the consumed power over 20 years as a function of an equivalent heat transfer coefficient. We performed 5,000 realizations and calculated the average value of consumed power and its uncertainty. We are refining the trade studies to consider multiple disturbances, but the current results are allowing us to gain a deep understanding of the design components. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Ross Rickards. Yeah, thank you. I'm here today on behalf of Lockheed Martin, and I'm going to discuss a few elements that we consider key enabling lunar infrastructure. Um, I'm actually the system architect for, for the vehicle here in the foreground, the lunar mobility vehicle, which is larger and faster than the Apollo LRV. It can transport crew uh, when crew is not there. It can uh, drive around the surface autonomously. It can map the surface, collect data. It can characterize um, and collect surface samples uh, so that the crew doesn't have to travel further. It can bring them back to wherever the landers are going to show up. It can uh, carry a host of other payloads. It can pull them off eclipse landers, put them on the payload bed, um, set them on the surface if they need to be like a seismometer, um, you know, relocate them as necessary, uh, including other larger uh, surface infrastructure like, like VSAT. In order to get this rover to the surface, we're also developing what we're calling a medium class lander, which you can kind of see in the far background there on the right. Uh, it's larger than the current class of eclipse landers. It has precision landing, can land in a, a variety of surface conditions. It, it can also land other elements such as, again, VSAT, which is you know, a popular topic today. Uh, lastly, you can kind of see just at the end of the, the title there at the very top, uh, we consider PNT as well as COM relays, a, a critical piece of lunar infrastructure. So Parsec is a, a small satellite that Lockheed Martin is developing uh, to serve that function. It can help with localization uh, for our rover, but also others. And uh, it can also serve as a comm relay on the far side. And all the details for these elements can be seen in both the physical poster and the poster that I'll be presenting at the virtual session um, as well. What's key here is we're, we're, we're not waiting for procurement. We're, we're leaning forward and building these systems uh, and, and approaching it more from a service-based perspective uh, and want to partner with all the other surface systems that will need mobility uh, and, and power, you know, being able to scale to about one megawatt uh, is what we're driving towards here in the near future, as Elliot was saying from Lunar Resources. Ross, I'm afraid so, your time has elapsed. Yep, and that's all, so thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Joshua Shapiro. 
Thank you for having me. My name is Joshua Shapiro. I'm a senior electrical engineer at Astrobotics in the uh, Lunar Surface Systems Group. I am the uh, PI for this wireless charger program. We have contracts under Tipping Point as well as SBIR. Um, so uh, some rovers are being built today for missions that built-in solar panels just are not practical. This can be dusty environments like excavation or performing experiments in permanently shadowed regions. Uh, yet all these systems still need a way to keep their batteries charged. So we are developing this wireless charging system with the partners you see here. Uh, we have ourselves, of course, we have Wibotic, NASA, GRC, University of Washington, and Bosch. So our technology uses magnetic resonance coupling, which gives us transfer efficiency of up to 85% with an operational window of, of plus or minus four centimeters misalignment, as well as a 40 degree offset of angular misalignment. Uh, both sides of the system have an avionics enclosure as well as a coil. And since the coil are exposed to elements during charging, they're actually designed to withstand temperatures of negative 200 to plus 175C. Transmitter avionics are approximately 20 by 20 by four centimeters with a 21 centimeter coil and a mass of three kilograms. The receiver avionics are approximately 10 by 10 by three, a 13 centimeter coil and a mass of 500. We have two variants in development, including 125 and 400 watt. And we've done demonstrations with uh, Kennedy Space Center's Razor with, um, and conducted testing with up to 12 different lunar simulants between KSC and University of Washington. And our system has shown minimal degradation for efficiency with the coil coated up to a kilogram. Elapsed, Joshua. No worries, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up, we have Mehmet Seifer. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I saw familiar faces here who are experts in the lunar infrastructure. So that's going to make my job easier because we are all aware of the limitations and drawbacks of existing space construction technologies. And that's why we are all here. In the past decades, and actually still, we focused on preventing cold welding in space, in spacecrafts, in satellites. But wait a minute, why don't we use it to construct assemblies in space? We are probably not the first people who thought of that, but I can say we are one of the first with the motivation to put effort into this. And that's how SpaceCo was born. I'm Sefer from Iowa State University. I'm the principal investigator of space construction technologies. It's a research and development in space construction organization funded by NASA Marshall, Make the Innovate of Iowa State University and Al Space of Arizona State University. The industry oxidizes metal surfaces to protect them and we remove oxides. The industry focuses on preventing cold welding, which we are doing intentionally. Our current work is heavily focused on structuring laboratory methodology to study cold welding for space construction purposes. The idea behind this process is actually very simple. We apply three layer coating to pre-designated joint surfaces on earth. After launching the structures into space or to the lunar surface, we remove the top layer and press these structures together. And this is where the magic happens. The joint surfaces start diffusing each other thanks to cold welding. If the proposed technology is used effectively, it can make institute space construction and assembly on the moon easier and safer than ever. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Richard Weiner. Hi, I'm Richard Weiner from Physical Sciences, Inc. in and Andover, Massachusetts, a principal research scientist there. And my slide here summarizes the concept and a few results from an STTR phase one project um, where our partner is MIT, shown there, and as well, uh, another company that spun out of them that is uh, involved in the additive manufacture of glass. And the objective of this project, um, as listed here in the um, top box, is to build uh, structures out of molten regolith glass, a, an approach that potentially provides a stronger and more consistent material than sintered, which is a more explore, explored method, 
and also is uh, amenable to an additive manufacture and potentially also a gas impermeable material for extension structures uh, beyond the lunar landing pad, which is our primary objective, uh, extension structures such as habitats. The concept illustrated at right there uh, marries uh, two technologies, um, from uh, one from PSI and one from the MIT Even Line group of concentrated solar thermal energy for the heat source and the additive um, uh, build of, of structures um, th that uh, is very similar to what uh, has been done from that group before with, with regular glass or soda lime glass. And um, we uh, had, the, the aim of this project was a proof of concept and viability for utilizing molten regolith glass to build arbitrary structures. And we had modeling efforts and experimental efforts illustrated here. Modeling went from um, uh, analytical production to the uh, 2D full physics thermofluidic fluidic modeling here. And the importance there is that we need to know what the structure uh, is like as it overlaps. And we also uh, did some experiments using both inductive and conventional heating to melt regolith and produce uh, some starter 3D structures and some molded parts. And uh, basically, we proved to ourselves that it was viable. I would Richard, say, I'm come visit our post poster session um, uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Alan Whittington. All right, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Awesome. Uh, hi, I'm Alan Whittington. Uh, I'm at the University of Texas in San Antonio, and uh, our poster is on thermal, chemical, and mineralogical properties of various lunar simulants. So I'm primarily a volcanologist. I do a lot of experimental work with lava. Um, and so I'm very interested in uh, how molten regolith behaves. Um, you will know about the various uses and applications of molten regolith. Um, one really important thing is how much energy does it take to actually produce, which of course is a function of its melting point, its heat capacity, and so on. So in this poster, we're simply presenting the results of uh, a lot of heat capacity experiments um, you know, using differential scanning calorimetry, comparing uh, the energy it takes to heat up uh, Luna Mare simulants and various Highland simulants uh, to their melting point. Um, and the two things we're comparing here, one is Mare versus Highlands, but another is different Mare simulants and different Highland simulants, because of course the moon is made of a lot of different stuff um, the mare are not all one homogeneous composition or the highlands. And one of the most important variables is the amount of glass that is present. So the agglutinates um, in the regolith make a very big difference to how much energy it takes to melt because the agglutinates are essentially glassy already. Uh, and so there you just go from glass to melt. Um, you don't have to melt crystals. Um, you know. Anyway, so um, to summarize, here are the results. Uh, and basically, the variability between Mare, the different Mare simulants, is quite large, likewise, between different Highland simulants. Um, and if you want to be able to melt things on the moon, then um, it would be good to make sure that you can do it with crystalline and glassy Mare and Highland simulants on the Earth. Uh, and then when you get to the moon, you can probably work with whatever the regolith is like wherever you land. Um, I'll have a virtual poster tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but certainly not least, we have Hunter Williams presenting on behalf of Evan Cloninger. And I'm just trying to pull that up. There we go. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I'm Hunter Williams. I'm the technology development manager at Honeybee Robotics. I uh, appreciate being able to talk to you all today. So LAMPS is our lunar array mass and power system. Uh, we were one of the winners of the LBSAT uh, phase two uh, competition and uh, Honeybee with our uh, parent company, Blue Origin is planning to take this all the way to the moon. Uh, we've been in discussions with some of our partners at uh, Lockheed Martin and Astrobotic about how we can do some of the things that LSIC is most interested in such as working together, building up uh, modular open source uh, platforms and uh, making sure that we're not doing the, uh, the thing that happened before USB of making a thousand different dongles uh, for, <laughs> for different electrical power supplies. So um, there are a lot of benefits to LAMPS. We hope to be the, uh, eventually when we start making permanent power stations uh, in the next few years, we hope that LAMPS will be the system of choice for that in particular. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to talk to you about our 
plans and what we want to do and uh, our roadmap for getting there because uh, luckily we are still able to talk fairly openly about what we are uh, what we are planning to do. Um, so yeah, that's all I got. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you very much. I'd like to sincerely thank all of our presenters and also sincerely beg the pardon of those that I had to interrupt. As a reminder, there is a virtual poster session that's taking place in Gathertown tomorrow at eight o'clock Mountain Time, 10 o'clock Eastern Time. We encourage everybody to participate. Thank you again. <laughs>